Welcome, River. Last week we considered the godly person. We learned that the godly that godly people love and are loved. They want to see the world through God's eyes. They see that this world was created and that is good. They call out sin when they see it and they fight for justice when need be. The godly person knows their life is a gift. They know their life is more than just random chance. And this person sees every blessing in their life and they savor those moments. The godly person embraces their lot. They enjoy the things they have. They know they don't deserve it. They know it's a gift and they know all the good things in their life, including their family and their friends, are gifts from their creator. But the person we meet in chapter 6, that's what we're doing today, is different. Both have a lot in common. For example, the person the person today is even more blessed than the godly person. The teacher explains that this person has money and wealth, family and friends. They even have what the teacher calls honor, which means that they have the respect of others. And from the outside looking in, this person has the, the world in the palm of their hands. And yet they still are not satisfied. And if we are being honest, we all fall into this attitude from time to time. So, number one is, everyone feels unsatisfied at some point. Just take a moment to think about that. The text tells us, Here is a tragedy I've observed under the sun, and it weighs heavily on humanity. God gives man riches, wealth, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all he desires for himself. But God does not allow him to enjoy them. Instead, a stranger will enjoy them. This is futile and a sickening tragedy. First, we need to understand that this does not necessarily mean that God has purposefully intervened to stop this person from enjoying what he has. What it is saying is that we are not built to always enjoy the stuff we have, to be satisfied with stuff. And God is just blamed by extension because he created us. This would be like you know a diesel truck being upset that it can't run on unleaded, or a Tesla complaining that it can't run on solar panels. The author's point is that we are not built to be satisfied by simply having stuff. We are not created to simply be content by having more. The teacher is saying that he wishes it was this easy. He's saying it would be great if having more was the cure for melancholy, sadness, and depression. If this was the case, we could just get more and be happy. But this is just not how happiness works. And he says that this is a sickening tragedy. He wishes that being content was as simple as just being rich. But sadly, being rich and being more blessed come with more work and more responsibility. So we talked about last week. Jesus explained it like this. He said, Much will be required for everyone who has been given. Who has been given much. Much will be required for everyone who has given much. And even more will be expected of the one who has been entrusted with more. So when we, when we are blessed with more, more is expected. If you're famous, you have the responsibility to use your fame for good. If you have more money, you are expected to give more and tithe more. If you have honor and respect, you need to leverage that honor in order to further God's agenda, not your own. And this is often why people who recognize they are blessed sometimes feel a bit depressed. The more you recognize you are blessed, the more you feel you should do more. We struggle and strive to do our best, and we often focus on the failures and not the successes. And this is because the more you feel blessed and know know your blessings, the more responsibility you feel. You begin to feel what people call guilt, but God's word calls conviction. We begin to feel convicted, and conviction is good. And you begin to feel a strong urge to correct not just your own thoughts, but also your actions. You feel blessed, which leads you to feel a need to give more and help more. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. With this knowledge comes healthy stress. This stress pushes us to help more and give and and to do what's good. God wants you to act in godly ways and to follow your convictions. But no matter what you do or how much you give, doing stuff, even good things, will not make you happy. Leads to point number two. No one thing will ever satisfy me. A man may father a hundred children and live many years. No matter how long he lives, if he is not satisfied by good things and does not have a proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. He comes in futility and goes in darkness. This man, this name is shrouded in darkness. Though a stillborn child does not see the sun and is not conscious, it has more rest than he. And if he lives a thousand years but does not experience happiness, do not both go to the same place? 
The teacher asks if you live and are not uh, never content, what's the point? The teacher explains that how no one thing will ever make you feel content. And he begins with the most important things in the world, for especially for people of this time period, having a family and having your health. So before we move on, it's important to understand why this is so powerful, especially for the readers then, but how it applies today. First of all, just as an example, during the time of Jesus, the average life expectancy for a Roman was around 22 to 25 years old. Also, having children was very hard. For example, 1 in 11 births during the time of, of Jesus were stillborn. So 1 out of 11 children just were born dead, meaning a huge percentage of children never saw the light of day. And of those who survived, 28% of children died before the age of 1. Add the mortality rate of women dying during childbirth, and you have to recognize that during this time period, just having a family was a blessing. So as you, as you can see during this time period, having kids and living into your 30s was, was all the average person could really hope for. Traveling the world was impossible. Having a vacation home was rare. There was no such thing as a 401k or retirement or the stock market. And today we take all this for granted. Relatively speaking, children rarely die, praise God, before their first birthday. Women rarely die in childbirth. And if you die before the age of 80, most of us consider you too young to die. And yet, despite all the blessings we have today, most people will grow old, however you define it, and die never really having been satisfied with their life. Most of us will be on our deathbeds with nothing but a list of regrets and wasted years to look back on. The teacher says that most of us will never even have a decent monument to chronicle our lives. What does this teach us? It tells us that health and family do not make us content. I guarantee you that if you had a told a Roman that he would be able to have as many kids as he want, that he would probably never lose a, life, a wife to childbirth, and that he would possibly live into his 90s, they'd have thought that they had landed in heaven. They would have thought that you had taken them up to Mount Olympus to live with the gods, and yet here we are with all of this, and we are still no more content than our ancestors. The teacher continues and says, all man's labor is for his stomach, yet the appetite is never satisfied. He says this because it seems that we were built to never actually be entirely happy, and this is actually true. The problem is that we often confuse happiness and contentment. You see, happiness is by definition a momentary feeling. You literally cannot be happy all the time, and this is by design. For example, you're not happy when you feel pain. That's on purpose. God designed pain to let you know that you are injured. Pain is designed to tell us that we broke our skin or broke a bone or whatever. It, it's purposeful. Of course, pain is misused and abused by people and out of control when we have cancer and these kinds of things. That's, that's a different topic. That, but those things go against God's design. Pain was never supposed to be used to or abused. It was always supposed to be our body's alarm system. It was designed to be a good thing. But when you are in pain, you're not happy. But the difference between contentment and happiness is that contentment is a matter of perspective and worldview. The difference between happiness and contentment is that you can be content and be in pain. You can be injured, go to the hospital, and be completely content with your care and, if you, and with your life up to this point despite the pain. And when you take the time to savor your contentment, that's when you experience joy. We see that joy is the experience of contentment. Joy is happiness lived. And this is why your worldview matters. Consider this other verse from Proverbs. A worker's appetite works for him. His mouth urges him on. Now compare this verse to Ecclesiastes. What do you notice? Just read through them. What do you notice? We see that both authors are dealing with a worker's appetite. But one sees the importance of not always being satisfied, while the other grieves and is sad about how he's not satisfied. The difference is worldview. See, Ecclesiastes is coming from the perspective of a godless world, a world without a designer, a world under the sun. The teacher is explaining the sadness of a person who is constantly feeling unsatisfied, but the godly wise person of Proverbs sees the world from God's perspective. They see the world from a godly worldview. 
This means that they even see their hunger as a good thing. They recognize that the feeling of hunger, just like the feeling of pain, fulfills a purpose. And it was designed by our Creator to physically motivate us. The purpose of hunger is to tell us we need to eat. Our bodies need nutrients. Our bodies require calories and protein and all sorts of vitamins, so our bodies crave it. We get hungry because God designed us to feel hungry. We feel hungry and it drives us to feed ourselves, to work, to feed ourselves, because God wants us to be healthy and safe. Hunger was designed to be a good thing. Hunger is a gift. But our bodies even crave specific types of food, like fruit and certain vegetables or certain types of meat, because our bodies can feel they're lacking in specific things, like a protein or calories or vitamins. And this may even explain why pregnant women sometimes have odd cravings like ice cream and pickles, or in, in very extreme cases, dirt and paper. One of the theories is that women who develop a craving for chalk or dirt or something are actually suffering from an iron deficiency or a vitamin deficiency, and their body is telling them to crave dirt to fulfill that need. The point is that your worldview is going to not just change the way you see the world, it's going to change the way you experience it. And this includes even your experience of pain and hunger. But only wise people actually realize this. But here's the thing. Knowing this is only half the battle. The text continues, and he says this. What advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage is there for the poor person who knows how to conduct himself before others? Better what the eyes see than wandering desire. This too is futile in a pursuit of the wind. This is interesting because he contrasts the wise person with the fool. But we have to remember what wisdom is. We talked about this already, but wisdom is knowing the right thing to do. But it doesn't necessarily mean you do the right thing. It, al it also doesn't mean you enjoy doing the right thing. There's also a difference between godly wisdom and basic human wisdom. For example, basic human wisdom is found in books like How to Win F Friends and Influence People. Great book. I recommend this book all the time. It has great, solid, very practical principles, but the most... But, but like most wisdom, it's not universal. It does not always apply in every situation. It's not always godly in that way. So, for example, Dale Carnegie, who wrote that book, said that you should never correct a man in his own house. He explained that you never argue with someone in their own, on their own turf, basically, because even if you are right, they'll be so offended, they'll never hear you anyway. And this is good and solid wisdom. I've heeded this warning many, many times, but godly wisdom teaches that this is not always the case. As the teacher explained, <clears throat> there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. An easy example is Jesus entering the temple and tipping over the tables of the money lenders. He's in the priest's house. He is confronting money changers who are just doing what they're told. And based upon this, Jesus broke a whole slew of principles laid down by Dale Carnegie. But the point is that Jesus was practicing godly wisdom. And this incident, for whatever reason, required a heavier hand in God incarnate in Jesus Christ knew it. This is why the teacher says, here he asks this question, <clears throat> what advantage is there for the poor person who knows how to conduct himself before others? His point is that just knowing how to conduct yourself, doesn't, just knowing a wise set of principles doesn't give you joy any more than telling yourself to just knock it off and quit being depressed actually works. It doesn't. The teacher is asking a rhetorical question, what's the advantage of knowing how to act if it doesn't make you happy? He follows this with a real issue that about your wandering desires. Wandering desires are all your conflicting priorities tearing you apart. Again, just knowing how to act and what to say doesn't change the fact that your desires are conflicting. Knowing you shouldn't want to drink when you are an alcoholic doesn't make it, make it easy to not drink. Just knowing is half the battle. Just knowing the right thing to do doesn't change who you are. Knowing you should be happy doesn't make you content. Knowing you shouldn't drink or do drugs or look at porn or do whatever it is you're doing doesn't make you want to do it. And he says, better what the eyes see than wandering desire. Obviously, you should be content with what you have. But just knowing this doesn't make it so. This is why G.I. Joe says knowing is half the battle, and this is true. You know you should be content, but you don't feel it. This is because something's off. In some rare instances, this could be a chemical problem, so don't misunderstand. It may be that you are struggling with a chemical dependency or your brain chemistry is out of whack. In those cases, you need to see a specialist. 
But more often than not, studies have shown us that it's your personality and character that is actually getting in the way of experiencing joy and peace. And we know from the studies from Yale, Harvard, and other schools that a lot of times changing your perspective and practicing gratitude, for example, is just as effective and even sometimes more effective than taking antidepressants. Which leads to point number four. We're trying to understand God's joy and peace. And number four is God created us and we need him. And there's a lot here, so let's unpack it a little by bit here. So he writes here in 6, 10 through 12, Whatever exists has get, was given its name long ago, and it's known what man is. So again, that sounds a little cryptic, and this concept of giving a name is important, though. We have to stop it because it expresses more than simply naming something. It implies the right to have authority over that thing. We see this all the way back in the first book of the Bible when God creates the world. Right away, God creates and names the, animal, the heavens and the earth. He creates the names and names light and darkness. He then follows this with the animals and human beings. But there's a difference here when it comes to earth and its inhabitants. God doesn't name the animals. He gives that responsibility and authority to humanity. The text says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the livestock and the animals and all the creatures on the ground. This is important to understanding our theology and, how, and also our responsibility on the earth. And how do people show their authority in that text? They are given the right to name the animals. They're given the right to define their purpose and define who they are. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to man to see what he, he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky and the wild animals. But here's the thing though. Who named mankind? Who made man and woman? God did. So who has authority over us? We have authority over the earth and all of its inhabitants. We're told to rule the earth, as, as it says in Genesis. But who has authority over us? God does. But he is not able to contend with the one stronger than he. For when there are many words, they increase futility. What is the advantage for man? For who knows what is good for man in life, in the few days of his futile life that he spends like a shadow? Who can tell man what will happen after him under the sun? Dr. Eaton explains it like this. Dr. Eaton's a theologian. He says, Thus the preacher is underlining the impossibility of changing the basic character of life. Man cannot escape his limitations. We are just people. Nor can he completely unravel the world's anomalies. We are limited by definition. <clears throat> but we, God is good. He has the authority. But we're limited. We'll never know everything. Again, this is a problem that we all face, but it's amplified if you deny God's existence. When you deny heaven and think that you live only under the sun. When you deny God's existence, you deny your own existence, your place on earth. This is why we need to know that God created us and we need, to, we need him. But pay attention here. There's a difference between saying God created us to need him versus the fact that we need him. It's very different. It sounds the same, but it's different. The difference is a matter of intention on the part of the creator. God did not selfishly require us to need him. God is not selfish or evil or arrogant. He created us in his image, and because we are not gods, because we are limited, we need him. The difference is subtle, but very important, especially for your lived theology. You need God not because he wants you to be dependent on him. He's not a dictator or a warlord. We, you need him because you are a temporal limited creature and you are made in his image. Meaning you have a tiny spark of the divine within you and just like a blender needs to be plugged in to blend things and a computer needs electricity to compute things, you need God to function. He's your energy source, your life source. You need to tap into your energy source if you want to be able to function in the world. And if you don't, you will break down and you will be corrupted. This is what happened when humanity sinned. We were separated from our God. And Dallas Willard, in our study on Wednesdays, we have a study, we're doing the Spirit of the Disciplines. Dallas Willard said this, and it's perfect for this study. He said, Robbed of spiritual truth and reality, of right relationship to the spiritual kingdom of God. He says, All aspects of mankind, social, psychological, and even our physical life of humankind, is disordered and corrupt. 
The whole reason we feel unsatisfied and why we fight and hate and war with one another is because we have universally denied the loving existence of God and so doing our part in his kingdom. We've rejected our creator. As Nietzsche said, we've killed God in our minds. And when we do this, we separate ourselves from the very source of life that we came from. And as we discussed last week, this is why we can't trust our intuitions. Because we are sinners. And we want things that will never make us happy. But wanting, remember this, wanting is not the problem. The core of the intuition is good. And you can finally begin to see this. And just like pain helps us to see our need to, to heal and hunger helps us to see our need to eat and sleepiness tells us that we need to rest, our desperate and insatiable need to be satisfied, to feel content, to experience joy, all of that comes from a deep, comes from a deep within our soul at the core of who we are as a people. It comes from our spirit crying out to reconnect with the God from whom we are separated. Dallas Willard explained it like this. He says, what is it that is missing in our deformed condition? From a biblical perspective, there can be no doubt that it is the appropriate relation to the spiritual kingdom of God that is the missing nutriment, the nutrient that we need, that our bodies are craving in our human system. Just like a pregnant woman craving dirt when she really needs iron, we try to fill our need for God with other things. We feel this insatiable need to reach out to God, but we crave the love of God, but we confuse it with sexual intimacy, so we give ourselves away. We desire to be connected to the kingdom of God, but we would confuse us with being part of something bigger than ourselves. So we join a political party, we campaign for some special interest, we volunteer, we crave a relationship with our creator, but we confuse it with a false religion, or we corrupt it, or we pursue enlightenment, or we ignore it and deny it altogether, and we kill God in our minds. The problem is that we are sinners, and we live in a sinful world, but it wasn't always that way. We were given responsibility, we were given authority, and we corrupted this world and ourselves. We created hatred, we created racism, we created slavery, we created corruption. We are the cause of sin, no one else. And sadly, because of our limited position, we have dug ourselves so deep, there's no getting out on our own. We are hopeless under the sun. But God so loved the world, God so loved you, that he sent his son to this earth. Jesus came to set an example for us, to... Show us how to live and to follow his example. We can finally see how to live right in love. But living and doing the right thing doesn't change who you are. Doing stuff is not the point. Living is not the only problem. There's also death. Death is waiting for all of us, young, old, rich, and poor. The teacher teaches that death is the great equalizer. You can't stop death. It's coming for you. But God's plan is better than our plans. Rather than simply teaching us how to live and even modeling us for how we should speak and act, which he did, our God also died for us as well. You see, we deserve to die. We corrupted the world and everyone around us, including yourself, if, we left, if we, it was just left up to us, we would cause more pain than love. But God still loved us so much that he died for us. He died for you. He paid the penalty for your sins, for my sins. He sacrificed himself so that we could let go of the guilt of a lifetime of sin. So we could start over new today. And salvation is as simple as accepting God's grace and mercy. That is all it is. It is a change of worldview. It is seeing the world from a different perspective. It is submitting your life to God, to Jesus Christ who died for you and accepting his death in your place. He lived for us, except his life. He died for us, except his death. And just admit the fact that God created you with a higher purpose and that you have not pursued that purpose. And now that you've admitted that, ask for forgiveness and ask God to guide you the rest of your life. Let's pray. Father, we praise you, God, and thank you. God, forgive us. Even those of us who have been in the faith for forever, forgive us. For those of us who have never known you, who are just hearing the gospel for the first time, the good news of your grace and mercy, we pray, Lord, that you would forgive us. We accept your gift of life. We accept your grace and your mercy. 
Forgive us our trespasses. Help us to forgive others. Help us to extend that love you give us to this world and help us, Lord, to change our lives so we can help others to come to know you as well. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you're watching this right now, we had uh, some snafu in our booth and it's it was inevitable. We didn't get our new computer until, until uh, Friday. Um, we had to express ship it just to get it by then. It was going to take two weeks at any other place. And uh, I have no doubt that Thomas tried the very best he could to make it work, but it just didn't for some reason. So you are missing out, but we also right now are doing baptisms. You're not seeing them, but I promise you I will record them and I will post them right after um, church service. So just check back in with our YouTube page and our Facebook page and you'll be able to see those baptisms. We have two baptisms today, if assuming both people show up. Um, I'm doing this on my day off, so I'm trying very hard to produce this um, just in case our live stream doesn't work. So uh, again, continue to pray for us and uh, I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday for the book study or seeing you next Sunday. And please also continue to pray, 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 pray um, for the, the funds to pay for the parking lot. We currently still owe $9,500. Several people had given more for the parking lot. Praise God for you. Um, but now that you understand, you are so very blessed. Just feel that conviction. It's not guilt. Don't confuse that. Feel that conviction. And if you feel convicted, like you need to take a little bit of that blessing and try to bless others and try to help the kingdom grow. In a very small way, you can help by helping us repair the parking lot so it's safer for people when they come. And um, we had to have repairs done on it and just help us to just let people know that we are alive and well. Amen. All right, well, God bless you guys. You have a great week, and uh, hopefully we'll be back to live streaming next Sunday. Keep praying. God bless.